Global Connections. I'm your host, Grace Chang, and I'm here today with Dr. Margot Kitt, Professor of Humanities and Religious Studies at Hawaii Pacific University. And we'll be talking about violence and the religious imagination. Hi, Margot. Hi, welcome, Grace. Welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Thanks for joining us. Um, so in addition to being a professor of humanities and religious studies at Hawaii Pacific University, you also are editor of uh, a couple of a couple of things, uh, the Journal on Religion and Violence, mm -hmm. as well as the Cambridge series on elements of religion and violence. That's right. And, and also actually another one, Oxford yeah. Research Encyclopedia of, of Religion, where I do the religion and violence stuff. Oh, interesting. Yeah, because you've written quite a lot of interesting work yeah. on this topic, which is, which is what we want to explore <laughs> further today. Um, recently, you introduced the, the uh, December issue of the Journal of Religion and Violence on violence and the biblical imagination. True. Yeah, and so, so I'm interested in this uh, topic that you're, you're writing about. And so first of all, can you tell a little bit about what you mean by religious imagination? Good question. Religious imagination is the new focus, right? There were uh, many decades, maybe five decades ago, people were still doing theology. When you think about religious studies, you think about the logos, about the, theo, the logoi, about theoi, the, the, the logos, about the arguments about God and the existence of God, right? There's a whole history of philosophy on that. But today, we're not so much interested in a God or the gods. And we tend to focus more on imagination because it is the stories of a religion, the narrative imagination that tends to capture people's hearts and souls and make them respond to certain themes. Mm -hmm. Themes like, um, you know, the good guys and the bad guys, the heroes, the villains, the, um, the, the just fight, the good war and the bad war, and things as good and evil and all kinds of stories that get under your skin, role models that get under your skin. So we have mm -hmm. so many of the religion loves stories, right? It's all about narrative that tends to motivate people to act in certain ways that they may not even know. They may not even know they're inspired by uh, religious narratives, but um, nonetheless, it tends to feed into a lot of our, especially our ide ideologies of conflict these days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So narrative is everything the stories, the imagination. Nowadays, we don't talk about imagination as much as imaginaries. This is a new lingo, I guess. But it's supposed to refer to um, the way the imaginations um, represent themselves or manifest themselves in action. So it has to do with certain things that you, you don't even know you're necessarily that you're responding to these ideas until you, until you're, you find yourself motivated to act. So this is an old idea. It's been around for about three decades, maybe. Koran mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Eijmer talked a lot about religion and the violent imaginary. And Charles Taylor is the one who really made the, the, the notion popular. He talked about religion as basically social imaginaries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're into the imagination now. Mm -hmm. So you might wonder, well, how does that differ from, how does religious imagination differ from any other imagination. And one of the ways to see this or to understand this is that religions tend to presume that all experience isn't flat. There's a deeper reservoir of, of either notions or experiences that you that, um, that motivate people, even if they're not always addressing them. So I suppose that would be the primary thing that makes a religious imaginary religious. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, if you think about it, religions include a lot of other stuff besides just codes of belief and rituals and things like that because it includes things like altered experiences and altered mind states and trance states and rituals that engender you know maybe terror or maybe delight and mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. so much more to it than just the old mm -hmm. codes of belief and mm -hmm. okay. sets of behaviors. So how, how these narratives um, foster imagination and the meaning behind these kinds of acts Yes. Uh, and in particular, you're interested in, in acts of violence. And so what do you mean by violence? What, con what constitutes violence that's in, in your study? That's just as complicated <laughs> as the notion Good. of an right. imagination, right? Uh -huh. So violence, uh, you know, we don't treat, in, when we're doing religious studies, we don't treat violence simply as a matter of wars. I mean, those are pretty um, ever-present these days. And of course, uh, there's a long history of religion and war. Um, but we look at all different kinds of violence. For instance, we look at... Um, the notion of 
um, I don't know, verbal violence, structural violence, the way that, you know, there's implicit uh, suppression built into the social schemes of things. Uh, we look at, um, you know, victory parades as tending to have a violent dimension because they're implicit threats. So we look at all kinds of, we look at violence as multifaceted. Even the way you think can be, you know, it automatically, you, you make decisions between what, what's good or bad. You make decisions of what's, what's uh, proper and improper, and you're always weighing against mm -hmm. um, some framework which manifests some kind of damage to, to something. Mm -hmm. You know, your violence itself is multi-layered, the way we treat it now. So we talk a lot about verbal violence and religious studies, because especially when we're dealing with narratives, because mm -hmm. and there are so many mm -hmm. outstanding examples of of violence, and of course religious traditions and mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the history of them. So is, I, is there a, an example of verbal violence you can give us as far as something absolutely. historical, contemporary? Yeah, no. Yeah. How about let's take some biblical examples because they're just so profound. The Bible has really captured Western imagination, right? So here's Here's a few just that I have to pull out. Here's, this is Isaiah 13, 6, 8. Wail for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. Because of this, all hands will go limp. Every man's heart will melt. Terror will seize them. Pain and anguish will grip them. They will ride like, women, like a woman in labor. They will look aghast at each other, their faces aflame. So this is an implicit threat, right? The coming from Isaiah, who's you know, supposed to be manifesting the, the voice of the God. He's a prophet. Um, and, you know, this is about losing your bearings on so many. It's not just about hitting each other. It's about losing your bearings, losing trust in the world. Here's one of my favorites from Leviticus. My favorites. It's not favorites. It's just, it's just <laughs> riveting. Here's from Leviticus. And I will make those of you who are left in the lands of your enemies so ridden with fear that when a leaf flutters behind them in the wind, they shall run as if it were a sword behind them. They shall fall with no one in pursuit. Though no one pursues them, they shall stumble over one another as if the sword were behind them. And there shall be no stand made against the enemy. Mm -hmm. And if you think about this, this is another threat from Leviticus, but it's about, you know, creating in you this kind of perception that the rustling leaf is a sword, you know, Mm. wielded by an enemy and you're going to lose your balance, you're going to fall, you're, you're going to lose your whole orientation and you're going to be yeah, that whole experience that there's something chasing you like, yeah. you know, in the alley in the dark of the night or something and you can't trust the world. That mm -hmm. There's, there's a, an implicit uncertainty to everything and there might be stuff out there that you just can't, your mm -hmm. perceptions aren't going to necessarily uh, grasp. So a lot of this um, a lot of this, these violent narratives are about how you relate to these stories and metaphors, of course, and metonyms and the whole, all the language that we use for understanding literature from the whole world, especially important in religious imagination. Because, um, you know, you're expected to respond. If you open yourself up to these stories, you, you can feel it, you know. It's not, it doesn't matter if you're not an Israelite in the land of an enemy, you know, you're, you can relate to this perception of that there's something after you and mm -hmm. that the world's not quite reliable. And that, um, that prophecy from Isaiah, I mean, that's just so implicitly terroristic. Terror will seize them, pain, pain and anguish, they'll ride like a woman in labor. I love that there are so many uh, female references in some of these, mm -hmm. these things. Um, but at any rate, and so it's not just the Bible, of course. The Bible is just one of many, many traditions. And there are so many um, examples of r the ritual inculcation of terror. I've been studying um, Africa for the last couple of years, and I, I wrote one of the introductions to our African issue of the Journal of Religion and Violence. And one of the things you learn there is there's a, you know, there are musical traditions which attempt to um, to make you experience things entering and leaving your body and there's drumming traditions and p dancing traditions and mm -hmm. people just participate in this altered world. Mm -hmm. It's not altered at the time, it's just ever present, totally real. But um, I don't know if you'd call this necessarily violent, but it's, it certainly gets in you and disturbs you. Mm -hmm. And it implies that yeah. you have a sensuous openness to uh -huh, these yeah. kinds of musical experiences. So it sort of goes beneath the old 
uh, the kind of cognitive framework that we tend to have in the West, especially when you're looking at religion. Mm -hmm. Also, in Af the African context, we have a lot of rituals which are supposed to make you uh, immune to bolt from the old wars in the 90s in particular, the Rwanda, actually um, it's more the west coast of um, Africa. You have so many interesting ritual attempts to make people impervious to battle mm -hmm. weapons. Mm -hmm. So you'll have, you know, in infliction of pain and mm -hmm. some cer certain kinds of cuttings that are supposed to make you resilient to bullets. You wear special clothing. You might wear, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, specially fabricated garments and uh, sometimes pieces of animals or mm -hmm. of other Some kind of fetish. Yes, uh -huh. a lot of those. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, who can say that those don't have real physical effects because people, people get, they scare the daylights out of the other side, for uh -huh. one thing. And they make you, if you've undergone this, these kinds of initiation rituals, you, you're on top of the world. You, mm -hmm. you got it. You know, you're, you're, in your, mm -hmm. you're in the fight part of the fight and flight thing. You, you, you're, uh, you're pumped. Yeah. So um, ritual is a really important element too, actually, in this whole creating narrative imagination. Mm -hmm. um, and there's so many examples, but the African ones are kind of exotic. So. Yeah. Yeah. And the rituals kind of highlight, um, you know, how how we think ma forces manifest themselves and how we can arm ourselves against those forces. Yeah. Or, that's, so a, that's really fascinating. Yeah, it is. And the, mm -hmm. the fact that these are 20th century wars that we're mm -hmm. still. Also in uh, the Mai Mai Wars, you know, those were, that was intense. Like they'd take, they eat certain, certain things they couldn't eat, certain things they could eat. They weren't supposed to bathe. You know, this is recently, like within the last two decades. And the whole world becomes suddenly a much more dangerous place, but you're, you're um, like, you're in tune. You're in yeah. touch with the dangers. Uh -huh. So yeah. there's, there's a there's lot of war magic. There's more to what's, amongst us than what we physically and can observe. Well, what we uh, observe. In a yeah, in a material level. But yeah. religion and the narratives provide us with uh, how we imagine those things. Yes, and I think those imaginations become alive. They're visceral experiences. People do have visions mm -hmm. in these battles. I mean, we have visions in any war, right, when there's a lot of adrenaline going. We have a lot of stories back from the days of the Crusades that people seen the Virgin Mary, for instance, on the battle, or the war in Yugoslavia, right? You had kids seeing the Virgin Mary at the boundaries between Croatia and, and um, or certain places they wouldn't, and they just like report to their parents and uh -huh. so the words get out. So but the point is that these experiences really do change your perception. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. in the West that we think, oh, it's just a matter of belief and uh, that screwy belief, so just put it aside, you know, mm -hmm. in, in context. And every war has this, even yeah. our, our wars, of course, just as much. You're in that, you're in the uh, sturm and drang, you know, of mm -hmm. battle and you're, you're alive. You're, so uh, it's not me uh -huh. to say that there isn't, that they're not real. I think people respond to them. Great, great. Um, that, that's great, great first half here. And I'm looking forward <laughs> to hearing more from you, Margo. Okay, oh, well, okay. I'll give you some examples. Yeah, later. so stay tuned, everybody. We'll be back in one minute. Aloha Kako, I'm Marcia Joyner, inviting you to navigate the journey with us. We are here every Wednesday morning at 11 a.m. and we really want you to be with us where we look at the options and choices of end-of-life care. Aloha. Hey, has your signal just been taken over or am I supposed to be here? This is Andrew, the security guy, your co-host on Hibachi Talk. Please join us every Friday on Think Tech Hawaii. Hi, I'm Marian Sasaki from Life in the Law. I'm so excited to be marching on Washington on Saturday, January 21st, with a, a big women's march on Washington. And here with me is Michael, who's heading up the local march uh, for women on Oahu. Come on out and visit us. We're going to be at the Capitol on January 21st, starting at 8 o'clock, uh, gathering by 9.30, and starting, uh, march starts at 10. All right, everybody, welcome back to Global Connections. I'm your host, Grace Chang, and I'm here with Professor Margot Kitts of Hawaii Pacific University talking about violence and the religious imagination. Welcome back, Margot. Thanks. 
Okay, so we, we were talking before the break on your research and, and some of the findings uh, in, your, in your studies uh, about this topic. Um, and we kind of concluded about how yeah, religion, the narratives are, uh, inspire this kind of imagination that, that, that uh, mobilizes people to act. And really, I mean, what you were saying before we went on break is, is how, uh, unlike some of the modern philosophers, you know, the world has not become disenchanted. Like, st religion still animates a lot of our, our imagination and our actions. It's so obvious, isn't it, when you open up the newspaper today, right? We have so many. Um, so much hostility on coming from these, like the dregs of the different religions. For instance, obviously we have tremendous um, Islamic, Jewish, Christian nexus of, con of tensions, at least at the moment. It's very hard not to, um, it's very riveting, very hard to take your eyes off of it, especially for me because my background is in the ancient Near East, which is the ancient Middle East. Mm -hmm. From modern perspective, it's an ancient, it's the Middle East, but from the European perspective, before the modern era was the ancient Near East. But nonetheless, I, I'm uh, personally riveted to that whole, that whole mm -hmm. mess, and it's, mm -hmm. just, it's just heartbreaking in parts. Yeah, and we, well, we see that also in, in any religious tradition, as you were talking about in, in African contexts, uh, as well as in you know, the Buddhist context, the 969 movement in Myanmar. Absolutely. Uh, and picking on the Rohingya Muslims. Yes, there's a mm -hmm. tremendous, um, every, no religious tradition. One thing that I really need to get out there, there are no religious traditions that have pristine histories. There's violence and even the Buddhist origins. There's, there's wars at the start, right, from Sri Lanka. And there's plenty of, obviously, we've had a lot of problems with the Tamils and the Buddhists in Sri Lanka as well, or some Tamils, LTTE. So yeah, no, mm -hmm. n nobody's got a clean slate. Yeah. So, and it's always w some people, right, within a religion, as you were saying, you're, you're coming from some of this violent uh, rhetoric uh, and behaviors being coming from the dregs. Not it's not the religion <laughs> itself, but 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 what's interesting is what you're talking about is, is studying the narratives of the religion. Yeah, and so the, the narratives are there. Come out. Yeah. The, the fact mm -hmm. that people harness them is because they're there. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's like I gave you some biblical examples, but um, they're. You know, anyone can, for instance, in the jihadi context, as you probably know, there are many verses that address jihad in the Quran. We're talking about the Islamic tradition. And uh, they, they range hugely from, you know, a kind of turn the other cheek ethos all the way to uh, kill the infidel wherever he may be found. But even in that, most, um, the verse that gets picked up by ISIS and folks like that and really exploited to their own ends. Right after that, it says, um, but if he asks for mercy, um, show him compassion, for God is merciful. So there are no just straight out um, Trump at the war kind of, kind of everything's contextualized, mm -hmm, that's my, mm -hmm. my point. So in the modern context, it's just obvious that everybody's, there's just, there are conflicts that are just breaking out under religious banners now. Are they originally religious? Are they intentionally religious? Do, does everyone think of them as religious? Of course not. There's so many different dimensions to, especially in the Middle East right now, there's so many mm -hmm. territorial issues and there's so much. But on the other hand, everything seems to feed into religion ultimately because if you're talking about, I don't know, something like suicide bombing, from our perspective here in the West, we just think, oh man, that guy's misguided. But, but, you know, when you look at it in context, that's very brave. There's people going out and, um, I mean, deluded as they may be, but I, they get heralded as heroes. They're, they're uh, role models for people, and there's, some, there's dimensions to this that I don't think we appreciate in the United mm -hmm. States. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's good. Believe me, I'm not, I'm not promoting it. Mm -hmm. But um, I just think it's really important that we understand mm -hmm. that there are cultural um, dimensions to these outbreaks that are not just a matter of rational choice theory, as we tend to mm -hmm. think of mm -hmm. things in political science, for instance. Yeah, religion is all about understanding the, the metaphors and the motivations, of, as I said, mm -hmm. the zillion times, the narratives that people can harvest, the, the role models, like from the mm -hmm. prophet and his companions, right? They're always, always held up as the, the perfect society of warriors who were fighting for justice and against injustice. and so. Those images are right there mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. harvesting. Yeah, 
Yeah, and it seems like a lot of religions, they do see uh, their mem the members of their community as, as either being victimized or threatened, and that's, that seems to be kind of the reason behind the compulsion to act in violent ways. Um, right. Is there any, I mean, is that correct? Or I, I totally agree with that, and especially in this country. You're seeing a lot now with um, the religious right, the Reconstructionists who want to, who feel like they're losing control of their society, and they pass rules about Sharia law, which have no relevance to anything. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and you have the Christian Reconstructionists, right, who want to go to re reconstruct this United States on a theological model of theocracy. And um, they are very insistent that this is a Christian nation. Mm -hmm. They're willing to uh, fight for it. And so we have the abortion clinic bombings and all kinds of Rush Dooney and his, his crew talking about how to with a proper family uh, arrangement where the wives honor the mm -hmm. husbands and you're kind of flipping back to some fantasy world which was not there in the Bible. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a made up world, uh -huh. right? They imagined. <laughs> yeah, because there's so many, yes, exactly. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But not necessarily based in the text. So yeah, there are plenty of examples, contemporary examples, or it's, although in some cases, for instance, in the settler movements in Israel, of course you have Israel is probably the most complicated, just as complicated as we are here in Oahu, right? You have people from everywhere and many different mm -hmm. points of view, and it's not like it's a homogenous society. But among the settler movements, um, a lot of the, the zeal is, goes back to Abraham and the, the, mm -hmm. and the idea, or in Moses, the covenant with Abraham and one with Moses too, mm -hmm. where they're given the land of Canaan. Mm -hmm. At least with Abraham that says, this is the land in which you will be strangers. But after the Moses covenant becomes more of a... Mm. All of these ancient narratives I kind of are, are very important. I think into, they're ripe for people. They, mm -hmm. Their seeds continue to shape, shape imagination. So mm -hmm. yeah. it's not like uh, anybody's forgotten them. I mean, and you were saying about, you know, political scientists and, you know, for the most part, I think, yeah, social scientists have assumed in the modern era, right, have assumed that human beings are, are rational, that we are enlightened and we've you know, we, we behave based on material, self-interest, cost-benefit analysis, but um, from, from the perspective of religious studies, it seems like, you know, if, if that has been the case for a period, it wasn't, it wasn't a very strong uh, expansion of, of that way of thinking, and that we've had sort of a continuous kind of, um, you know, influence of, of religious imagination throughout history. I think that's a really important point because um, it doesn't mean every aspect of your life is driven by religious models. Obviously, we do make rational choices with your bank account and various things. Um, but I'm sure you know the Protestant work ethic is, you know, just so, has so uh, structured American imagination of what it thinks that we are. And, mm -hmm. But uh, ultimately, it boils down to that individual motivation. You are, you rape what you sow, and these are all um, ideas that are harvested. Uh, from the Bible, but it it does seem to me we were really wrong to think that rational choice theory was the beginning and the end of of the whole thing. Because um, who would have thought, you know, 20 years ago that religion would be the inspiration for so many wars? We thought we were past that. Mm -hmm. And so, like, so present in a lot of our religious, uh, political discourse, social discourse, all around the world, including Absolutely. In, in very modern countries. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, um, so a friend of mine has written quite a bit for, for the Oxford Handbook online, which you can go check out in the Oxford Research Cyclopedia of Religion. He's written on Mark Jurgensmar and Cosmic War and how some of these old narratives are totally present for modern fighters who believe that they're fighting something bigger than just a wrong government. They're fighting, mm -hmm. you know, the end of order. They're fighting, they're fighting for uh, a worldview that that has to be there in order for, in many cases, redemption to come. It's hard to believe from a rational university oriented perspective, but there are many people who are waiting for the end of the world. There's raptures and Christianity and Judaism. You have the Messiah is going to come. You have mm -hmm. in Islam, you have the Mahdi is going to come. Mm -hmm. You have so many theories of, um, or pictures, imaginations of a, a time when everything's going to be put right if we mm -hmm. just fight the proper war and get rid of the bad guys. It seems, it seems trivial to us, perhaps, walking around in Honolulu, but I, it's, it's there. I mean, you just have to read the text. Read ISIS, you know. 
Mm -hmm. I think it's going to come in Raqqa. The, the end of the world, will, that will be the place for the salvation of the mm -hmm. chosen. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, I, m I remember reading about how um, you know, even the United Nations was read by some Christians as kind of an indication of the end of the world because mm -hmm. of uh, yeah, the, the, the disillusion of barriers among people and some of the, yeah, some of the themes that they and were right. finding uh, parallels in the Bible. So it's really fascinating how people, yeah, still, still, these ideas still resonate and, and come back to, to the present. And the, the Christian movement in the United States, it seems very present to this, is the, the one that fights for the, Israel has to have the, the promised land in order for Jesus to come back, right, for the second coming. And this mm. is... And so they're a very big lobby on behalf of Israel, this Christian group that's, you know. For Christian, for Christian interests. For, yeah, for, <laughs> for the a, a particular of, Christian. It doesn't mean all Christians uh, are like that, of course. Right, Christianity, 2,000-year-old right. history, it's not, it's not just mm -hmm. one thing. Mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah. Well, and you were talking about, you know, their, their cultural context. And, you know, all these religions, universal religions like Christianity, um, Islam, I mean, they're, they're you know, Christianity is not just, Christianity we have in the U.S. or in, even in the West, like Christianity is a global religion and like the cultures of, of those regions do animate that and the imagination, I, I assume. Huh? It's so true. Africa is just a great example. Islam and Christianity have been indigenized in such interesting ways. Indigenized in the sense that they've been, I don't know, melded with pre-existing traditions and they seem to do just fine, right? Mm -hmm. um, living integrated together. I don't mean the people, I mean the, the, the whole world views are just the integrated different elements. And Christianity's always done that, right? And where do we get the Easter Bunny? You know, it's, obviously we have a lot of old traditions that... Uh, kind of secularized, but still, we yeah. can't erase the religious foundations of it, right? Yeah, and why is that associated with Easter? You mm -hmm. know, and there's, there's always so many. Yeah, so um, in the West, we've yeah, we take a lot of this stuff as a matter of faith, you know, like it's some interior condition. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that's how these traditions tend to be experienced necessarily everywhere. When, when there's instead, um, you know, particularly among certain evangelicals, there are, there are experiences that happen. You, you feel transported. You're, you're born again. You have, these are the kind of experiences that are, would have been hard to put into a philosophical narrative 50 years ago, mm -hmm. I think. It, yeah. And, and the academia, but now they're essential. Thank you. Thank you so much, Margo. Um, it's really interesting to hear from a religious studies perspective, and, and your research has, in this field is, is very, yeah, it's really fascinating. So thank you for coming on the program and enlightening us. So I encourage anyone who wants to, to go to the Journal of Religion and Violence, and there are some articles that are on, that are gratis or on free. You can just read them, the introductions and a few other things. Um, I don't know if you can necessarily get Oxford Handbook online, but some of these, if you write to me, I'll give you a password, I'll let you get in. <laughs> Thank you for joining us.